forgive me. Amen. Don't hold it against me. But we will try to get it done. Amen. Just take it off next week. Take it off next week. We'll, we'll do that. I'm afraid if we keep doing that, we won't have a Sunday service. <laughs> We're in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8 starts <coughs> the seven trumpets. It's the seventh seal, and the seventh seal open becomes the seven trumpets. Then later on, we will see the seventh trumpet will become seven bowls. And every time these series are open, you can look for more intense wrath from God upon the earth and those who have chosen not to believe in Jesus Christ and His finished work at Calvary. You see, it's one thing to believe in Him. Scripture says to us, even the devils believe and tremble, but they aren't saved. So it's one thing to know about God. It's one thing to know about Jesus. It's one thing to even believe about Jesus. Many of the religions in the world do believe in Him. The Hindus believe He's a good teacher. That's as far as it goes. The Mohammedans believe He's a good prophet. But that's as far as it goes. Even the woman at the well, did you remember? She thought it was a Jew. Oh, you're a Jew? Why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. Then she said, well, you've got to be a teacher, a prophet. But by the time he got through talking to her, exposing her sin, she realized she was talking to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lord of God. That's where we have to get to to be saved. We have to get beyond just knowing Him with a head knowledge. We have to get beyond just believing that He exists and that He was a good person. We must believe not only in Him, but what He did. And then we must trust what He did to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us and to wash those sins away. And when we believe that, we can stand on the rock that if any time some thought comes back about past sins, you can know it's the devil because he's the accuser of the saints. Once you have come to God and you have confessed your sins to God, He will never throw them in your face again. Satan wants to trip too many people up. He wants them to dwell on the past and what God has done in the past. But I want to tell you, we have a God who was and is and is forevermore. Amen. Yes. He is the God of your past. But he's also the God of your present. And He's the God of your future. Yes. And we can walk with heads held high when we know that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen? Yes. We don't have such condemnation from anybody. Or any devil. Because God's taking care of it all. He said He'd put them away from you as far as the east is to the west. They'd be cast into the sea of non remembrance. In other words, He remembers them against us no more. Now, this is important because it's just that that makes you eligible for the rapture. It's just that that makes you the bride of Christ, the church. It's just that which will bring your deliverance from this tribulation we're talking about. God will rapture the church before all this judgment begins to fall. Amen? Amen. Now, you'll see it because I firmly believe that people in heaven know exactly what's going on down here. I believe God knows exactly what's going on down here. He said, well, if they know what's going on, we're not making sense. No, they're in the presence of God. They've got the joy of the Most High. They've got a joy that we have not yet got to get. They've got a fullness of joy. 
And not only do they have a fullness of joy, they have a fullness of knowledge. The reason we're so sad is we don't know anything yet. We don't know what God's up to many times. And we don't know how God's working many times. But this one thing I ain't can sure, if you're a child of God, God is working for the best in your behalf. Amen. Amen? God only wants the best for you. Not the second best. If He wanted the second best, He would just left the law in place. But He says, I'm sending you the best. I'm sending you the only begotten Son of God. The only one i got. I've gotten one more in the closet I can hang out. Got one. And I'm sending Him. He will be the sacrifice for sins. He will arise from the dead. And then He will take His rightful place again by the Father at the right hand of power to forever make intercession for you and I. That's the kind of God we're serving. This God we're about to talk about in Revelation chapter 8 is a God who is holy. And not only is He a God of love, but He said, the soul that sinneth shall die. And to put that just in plain English, it means the soul that makes a life of sinning and keep on sinning shall die. He doesn't mean if you fall down one time and you get back up and brush yourself off and say, God, forgive me. John covered that. He says, My little children, I write unto you that you sin not, that you do not commit an act of sin. But if you do commit an act of sin, you have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ, the righteous. He says, If you fall down, get up. If you fall into temptation, get up. Because you're human. Now, he doesn't tell us to go justify. I got to sin a little bit every day. Because the moment we start saying we've got to sin a little bit every day, we make grace of no effect. God said, Where grace, where sin did abound, grace did much more superly abound. Amen? Yes. The reason for grace is to keep us from sinning. Amen? Amen. Yes. Now, we're going to sin. We've got a sin nature that ain't yet crucified like it ought to be. It's supposed to stay crucified, but guess what about crucified things? They tend to raise from the dead. So we have to mortify the deeds of the flesh. We have to keep the old man crucified. And if we were in a perfect world, we would never sin again. But we're not. Therefore, we need Jesus still. Therefore, we need the blood of the Lamb still. And we still need to repent every now and again. And say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Cleanse me. Wash me. Let me get this spot off my wedding garment so I can stand white and holy before you. Amen? Now, the six seals of God's judgments have been revealed. There's a divine interlude for mankind to reflect on what they believe to be God's wrath and the end of the world. God also uses this time to seal 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will carry the gospel to the Jewish nation. He reveals that there will be a multitude of people that no man can number from all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues who will be saved during the tribulation period. That includes Jews and Gentiles. Yes, Gentiles will also get an opportunity to get saved during the tribulation period. Now we're up to the seventh seal, which contains seven trumpets of God's upcoming wrath. We're going to look at the first four, only those today, because they're contained in chapter 8. Then we'll look at two more. And then there'll be an interlude. And we'll look at the last one that will blossom into seven bowls. Understand this. God has been long-suffering with mankind. But there's coming a day when they will be judged and experience the wrath of God for themselves. We need to understand that. We are blessed because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When He hung on Calvary, the wrath of God was put on Him. The sin of the world was put on Him. We move from condemnation to being free in Jesus Christ. 
We went from the wrath of God into the love of God. So we've got something to be glad about. I'm a child of the King. First, in Revelations 8, 1 through 5, God answers the prayers of the saints. Notice, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there was voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. There's a silence in heaven for the space of about half an hour. This is a <clears throat> dramatic pause. It is a time of silence. It is a time of reverence. Remember when somebody dies and something bad happens and somebody says, let's take a minute of prayer. Let's take a minute of meditation. Let's take a minute of silence. This is what's happening in heaven. A half hour is a time of reverence for what's about to happen. And I assure you, it's not going to be good. Seven angels would stand before God are given seven trumpets. This time the earth will receive the fullness of God's wrath. Now, remember we used the number 7 and we used the number 12. When we said about the number 7, it meant perfection. But we also said about the number 12, it also meant perfection. But the number 7 means perfection in completeness and fullness. The number 12 means perfection in power and authority. Each time we look at this, we begin to see God's perfect attributes and how they are distinguished in Him. Now, we know there are communicable attributes and there are incommunicable attributes. What does that mean? Incommunicable attributes mean that God won't give them to you. That's omniscience. Omni omnipotence and omnipresence. Those three never share. But, His communicable attributes, those He will give you, Love, joy, all the character and nature of God that He will give to you. His anointing, He'll give that to you. Amen? So when we begin to look at this, we begin to see how God is moving and something is moving Him. What's moving Him? These seven spirits, which are before the throne of God, we believe to be the third person of the Trinity. But then the seven angels represent that fullness and completeness of God's message which is about to be given concerning His wrath. Another angel comes. Lots of angels in heaven. Offers up the prayers of the saints to God with incense. But what are these prayers in this act of worship and intercession? Mixed with these prayers are the cries of the martyrs in Revelation 6.10 as they cried with a loud voice how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? God is about to answer those prayers and those cries. And yours. If you have been praying, Lord, how long will this evil go on? How long are you going to judge these things? How long are the wicked going to be taking advantage of the righteous? Those prayers are going to be answered. Because the wicked... If they don't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and if they accept Him, they're no longer wicked. They're righteous. But the wicked who refuse Jesus Christ and the finished work of Calvary, they're going to be the recipients of the answer to this prayer. The angels which carried the prayer of the saints to the Father now takes fire from the altar of God, just like He did. Mix the prayer with incense. Now He mixes fire with it. He casts it to the earth. And this signifies the loosing of the seven trumpets. Now we move on. Six trumpets of the seven are released of God's wrath. The seventh, before you get there, will be another interlude. And then those seven trumpets will go again into seven bowls. The first trumpet. There followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And this was cast upon the earth. One third of the parts of the trees were burned up. And all 
green grass. Do you remember this is imagery of the seventh plague on Egypt? In Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 25, and also see Ezekiel as he prophesies it in Ezekiel 38, 22. The fraction indicates that the judgment is complete, not final. Not complete or final. Remember that a small fraction, 25% have already been devastated. This is accompanied the opening of the fourth seal in Revelation 6. 8. Remember 25% of the world's population. We only got 75% left now. And of that, God is now attacking man's basic survival food. The trees that provide shade, fruits, nuts, and wood for fire are attacked. As well as the grass that sustains life for man and beast. God's affecting the very basic things that keeps man alive. This is the intensity of His wrath. No wonder they're going to try to barter and sell in order to get something. They're not going to have a whole lot to get. Remember we said the last time when the first 25% were bothered and the barley and the wheat were bothered that it took a day's wage for a man to buy one meal, his meal, and split among his family members. The second trump is a great burning mountain. We know what burning mountains are. We call them volcanoes. This was cast into the sea. And one third part of the sea became blood. So that one third of the creatures which were in the sea died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. What's God doing? God now takes away one third of the commerce, as well as the creatures of the sea, which provided food, oil, and money. He's taken away even their comfort stuff. What a terrible time that is going to be. The sea turned to blood reminds us of the first plague on Egypt in Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 through 21. This is a divine judgment that will affect the world's commerce and its source of a food supply, as well as its oil for domestic use, such as oil for life. Now, in those days, olives were used, olive oil was used as a means of fire. But a lot of them took whale oil and used whale oil to light their lamps. This now is affected. He's taken away their light. He's taken away their comfort. He's taken away their means of making money. One third of the people. The third trumpet in Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. The third trumpet sounds in a fire star named Wormwood fell causing one third of the rivers and fountains of water to become bitter. Now, Wormwood is a woody herb in Palestine that is bitter. That's where the name comes from. That's when John saw that the waters were turned bitter. The first thing that hit his head, Wormwood. So the star is named Wormwood. It's not poisonous, but it makes the water unfit to drink. This is used to describe the suffering and the calamity of what the people are experiencing. It's bitter. It's sorrowful. God first takes away one-third of the water that gave food, money, and oil. Now He takes away one-third of the fresh water that also gave food, but the more kind of water that sustains the life for men, beast, and food. Products such as barley, wheat, or vegetables. He takes away fresh water. If you don't have fresh water, you can't grow vegetables. If you don't have fresh water, you can't sustain life. It's been proven that man needs water at least every three days. Go beyond that, you're going to dehydrate and you're eventually going to die. You can go a lot longer without food, but you can't go a real long time without water. This seems to be the reverse of the miracle at Mara. Do you remember? God's people comes to the waters there. The waters are bitter. And God works a miracle and they are made sweet. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 25. One third, one third. 
Now we've already lost 25%. Now we got one third, one third. 25% meant there was 75% left. One third of 75 means 25% more gone. Only leaves about 50% of the world's population. The fourth trumpet, Revelation 8 12. The fourth trumpet sounds, and man is pitched into partial darkness. This makes man symbolize the darkness of his sin, his disobedience, and his transgressions. Do you remember when Jesus hung upon the tree? That at midday it was dark over all the land until three o'clock? It's because the Son of God was dying. The light of the world was being put out, and man was going to be pitched into complete darkness to show man exactly where he was coming from. Remember, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. One third part of the sun, one third part of the moon, and one third part of the stars are darkened. Again, God's judgment affects those things that give life, warp, enables the creation to reproduce itself. You're going to have one third less fruit. One third less grass. That's if there's anything left. You're going to have one third nuts. The sun's necessary. They have to have photosynthesis. Chlorophyll has to be produced in order for fruit to happen. In order for the tree to feed itself. And now darkness is coming. But this is not new to us. This is not new to lot, some folks. There are places on earth now that for six months they're dark. In six months they have light. And there are some places that have long days and short nights. And some have short days and long nights. So we already know something about the darkness. But note, this may affect the 24-hour cycle of day. Or the night may be shortened by one-third. And only have 16 hours. Whatever effect, imagine what's going to happen to the plants. Imagine what's going to happen to the people. I want to tell you the people that are in Alaska and have put up with six and six, they have mental problems sometimes. The darkness gets to them. And the light all the time gets to them. And if you're going through this, it'll get to you. Now, we've had some of that, haven't we? How do you feel when the lights go out and you sit in darkness for several days? You go looking for a candle, don't you? You go looking for a flashlight because we don't like the dark. We've got to come to the light. This is what happens. <coughs> the fourth trumpet reminds us of the ninth plague on Egypt. Thick darkness covered the land for three days in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 23. Now these references to these Egyptian plagues suggest that in Revelation we have the final exodus of God's people from the bondage of a world controlled by hostile power. Mm -hmm. Revelation is telling us about our exodus. The rest of the world's exodus. Those that are going to be saved during tribulation. And it brings us to this. Another angel flies through heaven declaring with a loud voice, Woe! 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 To the inhabitants or people of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels. Well, you shall yet to some. These last three trumpets are going to be worse than the first four. You say, how can it get worse? Friends, you ain't seen nothing yet. Things are going to get worse in a hurry. These three woes correspond to three final trumpet plagues. Revelation chapter 9, verse 12, 11, 14. Revelation verses 10, 1 through 11, 13 will be that interlude we've been talking about. The seven bold judgments of chapter 15 and 16 apparently constitute the third woe or the seventh trumpet. The woes fell on the unbelieving world. The phrase, the inhabitants of the earth, refers to the wicked. In Revelation 6, 10, not on the revelation of the righteous. In Revelation 9, 4. In new sets of God's judgment, the judgment becomes more intense. Man could have escaped all of this 
if only had accepted the finished work of Christ on Calvary. Jesus took the sin of the world and the wrath of God on the cross with Him. When He arose from the dead, He purchased the victory for all those who have faith in Him. And what more fitting thing could we do this morning than to remember the communion? Because in the remembering of the Holy Communion, we remember His death and resurrection till He comes. Remember the suffering of the Lord upon the cross. But you also remember the tomb could not hold Him. Death could not hold Him. Satan was defeated and could not hold Him. He lived to die. He died to live. And in His living, He brought light to all of us dead sinners. In Him, there is light. In Him, there is light. In Him, there is grace and mercy. As we pause in a moment to pray, I want you to reflect before the receiving of the Holy Communion. I'm going to ask my brother here and my brother here to help us with this Holy Communion this morning in serving. But before we do, we want you to pray and reflect. Ask God to search your hearts. If you have bitterness against anybody, turn it loose. If you have grudges against anybody, turn it loose. You cannot come to this Holy Communion with those things in your heart. You've got to let them go. If you're angry about something that God has done or somebody has done to you, let it go. For God in this Holy Communion will heal our spirit, our soul, our body, our mind and emotions. Do you remember after He took the Passover lamb in the Exodus? There was not a sick one among them. When they took that Passover lamb, symbolic of our Lamb of God, everybody who left Egypt left well. They didn't take a sick Jew with them. <laughs> Amen. And I want to tell you, I've seen people who've taken this Holy Communion and God melt them. Tears began to flow because suddenly they had been released from something they carried all these years. I've seen people who've been sick mercifully healed by God as grace is ministered through the Holy Communion. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask You to search our hearts and know us, O oh Lord. Cleanse us and prepare us to receive the Holy Communion. Release us of all anger. Release us of all bitterness. Release us of all wrath or anything we hold against anybody or anything. Let us be free, O oh Lord, of all the fetters Free of all the chains that have bound us. And let this be our liberty day. Set us free, O oh God, of all things. So that when we receive this Holy Communion, we will receive it in peace and in joy. Sanctify these elements, O oh Lord, right now. Minister grace in Jesus' name. Amen.